morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Um, thanks for coming out on a Friday morning. It's great to be here at Creative Mornings. And thanks to Elise and Jade and Phil and Biz Dojo for inviting me. Um, so I'm Jason Gallia. I'm a Visual Effects Technical Director down at Wedded Digital um, in Wellington. And this, the theme of this series is the magic at the intersection of art and technology. And to me, that's exactly what visual effects is, and that's exactly why I'm so passionate about it. So what I'd like to um, talk about and show you a little bit of today is what I do, how I came to do it, um, why I love it, um, and how creating magic by uh, merging art and technology is, is just a great description of the kind of work that we do. So what is a technical director? Um, after a few cocktails, I might say it means that technically I directed the movie. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's not true. Um, but I do things like lighting design, um, fluid simulations, and particle effects, uh, model making. Um, so in other words, I make giant monsters made of lightning sometimes. And sometimes I make cities out of gold. And sometimes I make vampire rottweilers, um, as, you know, as, as you do. Um, film's a collaborative art, and every effect shot takes a whole team of artists and technicians to, to create. I should stop that. <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little disturbing. Um, I don't know how. Um, but to make it look real, you need to observe how things work in, in the real world so you can painstakingly recreate it on film. Uh, things like the property of light, for example. Uh, simple concepts like how shadows behave in, in different contexts. And concepts like refraction, the way that light bends through glass and at an angle or index of refraction about 1.5 and, and through water at 1.33 and um, beer at 1.345, which is very important uh, to know. Um, some more complex concepts as well, like bioluminosity, organisms that actually give off light. It's a, a biological phenomenon we, um, we uh, re recreated extensively on Avatar. Or what we call subsurface sub scattering, the way that light gets absorbed through the skin and bounces around, um, picks up some of the property and color of the skin underneath the surface, and then bounces back out. You can see it in your friend's ear when there's a a light right behind them, it almost looks transparent. And you need to be able to think in 3D space and have a good grasp of the technical aspects of digital lighting. Um, things like ray tracing, um, and this atropic uh, shading, HDRI, and a solid um, understanding of the fundamentals of photography are absolutely essential. Things like how shutter speed and, and aperture uh, will affect your depth of field and, and your exposure. Equally important, you have to be able to speak the language of film through the art of lighting. Three-point three lighting, for example, um, key fill and rim, the, the, the key to bring your eye to the, to the subject and give shaping to it, fill from the opposite side to make sure your shadows aren't black and rim, to separate your foreground from your mid-ground and background, developed during the black and white era, but still our, our go-to lighting rig that we still use today. But what we really do, if we do our jobs really well, is to use all that technical knowledge and all those tools and take a, a bunch of ideas from our artistic imagination and give it life. And if we do our jobs well, hopefully, you won't even think about it. You won't even notice who were there, like a ninja. <laughs> uh, and that, that's kind of the greatest compliment we can get, that you, that you didn't notice, that you didn't notice who were there. And it's kind of an ironic compliment, if you think about it. So uh, one of the first questions I get asked a lot is, how did you get into this? And I think my background helps explain why I got into this line of work, blending science and, and art. Um, I'm originally from New York, as, as Jay mentioned. Uh, my dad was a doctor, my mom's a nurse, and, and that's probably a more accurate uh, representation of, of New York. I, re I remember my first coloring book. 
a book was about this thick about the human brain, and I, I actually just searched for it and I found the the the, uh, the cover of it on Google. Um, I, my dad gave this to me when I was about five years old. It made me color it as cerebellum red, and the medulla oblongata green, and uh, the hypothalamus blue. So I, I always grew up thinking I would be a doctor or some kind of scientist, like one that could like, draw cartoons or something. And I was always the kid that got in trouble doodling on desks and, and uh, drawing in class. And even in my early drawings, I was always concerned about light direction and, and composition. Or trying to express how I experienced the things that I saw through a quick sketch. This is uh, the Berlin Wall, like how I just trying to capture how I saw it um, when I was in Germany a little while ago. And also trying to observe parts of life that I found kind of under-noticed and under-appreciated. And sometimes just drawing the parties. So I didn't study film or effects at all. When I was in college in the 90s, not, not too long ago, um, visual effects wasn't really, it didn't exist as a major yet. Um, so after a year of biochemistry, I became the political cartoonist for my school newspaper. And then I discovered architecture. And I loved it. Um, this is in me. This is uh, Levius Woods, one of my favorite architects. And I learned how to design, how to draw better, and, and, and also importantly, how to put my work out there for, for critique and defend my ideas. Pretty much everything except learning how to build a house that would actually stand. Um, interestingly, in graduate school, we weren't allowed to use computers our first semester, at least. Uh, this is another Olympia's Woods as well. Um, we designed it on paper first, sometimes on napkins, and then the drafting table. Uh, we weren't letting the computers do the, do the, the design at all, and I, I, I really got to learn and understand why they call it CAD, Computer Aided Design. And this taught me one of the most useful lessons that I've ever learned about being a creative in today's technological environment, and it still holds true. Um, your creative imagination will always be greater than the technology at your disposal. And I think the challenge is to transcend those tools. And to me, this sums up my philosophy about that. This is um, uh, done in 1784 by Etienne Boulay. It's a cenotaph to Sir Isaac Newton. It's a huge sphere, ridiculously huge, 150 meters high. Um, surrounded on a, on a pedestal, surrounded by cypress trees. You could see the scale of people. Like right there. Um, there's no way you could build this thing. There's no possible way this could have ever been built. Uh, but he designed it anyway. I made the prints for it. And you look at all the drawings, you, you believe it. This is a real building. Uh, but we still couldn't build this. And to me, that's what magic is. And that's, that's, how, I want, that's how I want to think. But it takes a little while to transcend the tools. Um, for instance, my university had a new piece of software when I was there in graduate school at Rice. Um, no one knew how to use it yet, so it wasn't being taught quite yet. Uh, but it was, a, it was a tool called Alias Wavefront, and I heard Toy Story was made with it. And um, that was a lot cooler than AutoCAD. So I decided to learn that, and thanks to my friends at Pixar for giving us permission to use this. It took a while, um, uh, a lot of all-nighters and commandeering a whole lab of SGIs and uh, zip disks. Uh, but I made my first animated short. It was a three-minute um, animated short of, uh, of, of, a, of a mosquito doing a, a turntable set um, as a DJ. And I don't have it now because it's on VHS. So. Uh, but it got, my first, it got me my first job in movies. I got a gig as a render wrangler on Ice Age, pretty much a glorified digital janitor. And other people were doing all the creative work. My job was kind of purely technical. I would get in early before anybody else, submit other people's work to dailies, stay later than everybody else to make sure the renders didn't fail. Um, but I learned a lot. And by the time the film wrapped, I was a digital compositor Ice Age, and I got to see my name up on credits on the, on the film screen at, at the premiere of Ice Age at Radio City Music Hall. And you always remember your first time. Uh, but, but that's not my favorite part of working in movies, actually. Not even, not even close. 
My favorite part is starting a new movie. There's a, there's a moment when I, I, I go into work and I sit down, you know, we have a meeting and, and I find out what I'm going to be doing for the next um, months or years. And it's always so random and I, I never really know what's coming, never know what I'll be asked to do in my life in the next few months. And, uh, but I know I'll always make it work um, and I, I know I always will. Like, make, sh make, make lightning shoot out of this guy's hand? Okay, so I become an expert in, in lightning for a few months, you know? Or, or create a vampire dog, like I showed you before, probably too much. Um, so I ask everyone to bring in their dogs to work so I can open up their, their mouths and jaws and take a look at their canines and, and be able to recreate exactly how a dog, dog's mouth dentally would look and drool. Um, one of my favorite uh, one of these stories is uh, was my first day at a, a little boutique visual effects studio that I worked at, no longer around, unfortunately. It was a great company called um, Giant Killer Robots. I walked in, they showed me a quick clip of a female Terminator touching the ignition of a, of, of a police car, and then the car starts up. And they needed me, but they asked me to design a shot that goes in between uh, her touching the ignition of the car, and the car starts up. How does that happen? Um, so a friend of mine went to a garage, uh, to, to a, a garbage dump. You know, it's, it's San Francisco; they do that kind of thing. Uh, it got a huge steering wheel shaft, gave it to me, and put it on my desk for kind of inspiration. I got to really kind of look at it close every day, um, and we managed to rent one too. Uh, the same kind of from the movie. So I popped the hood and I photographed the whole engine inside and started to rebuild all the parts. And I thought, you know, of course, I'll treat it as an architectural fly-through through a city made of automotive parts. So I, I built all the parts, um, I, but I didn't really need to use all the parts of an engine. I had to take a lot of automotive license as well and move to ship them around so it's not completely uh, or automotively accurate. Um, to give it a feel of shooting through little alleyways and, and streets. And uh, for the, uh, like, like that, that's my first animatic that I did of it. I'm not sure how to stop it, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, and then the idea was after this, it would go to us, the electricity would, would follow it to a circuit board, and then it would, uh, you could see it taking over the circuit board, and that's how it starts up. So for the circuit board, I took a circuit board like this from IT and I scanned it. I brought it into Illustrator and converted it to a vector EPS um, at home and I brought it back on the disk and uh, I converted it to vector paths that I brought into Maya. So I recreated the circuit board in 3D, laid down the paths onto the model and used the paths to um, direct where the electricity, the little bursts of electricity would go. And it, this was the final shot. And this is about four seconds. And it took me about a month to do. Um, and it's a, it was a very unorthodox way to go about designing a, 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 an effect shot. I, but I didn't know any better. And I still hope I don't, to be honest. So after working in San Francisco for a few years on movies like The Matrix, but not, not the good one, unfortunately, uh, Fantastic Four, uh, some Captain Crunch commercials, I got recruited to go down to Sony Pictures in, in Los Angeles and um, worked on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Ghost Rider, I Am Legend, some other movies. Um, then I got recruited to, uh, then I got asked to work on The Dark Knight in London. And I got to redesign one of Batman's weapons, his sticky bombs. I'm uh, starting with only uh, paper sketches and mocking them up in Coke cans, which I would slice up and cut up and smash uh, so I could get the look of it down before I modeled it and, and textured it and ripped it and lit it. And just so you know, um, sticky bomb mock-ups made of Coke cans must look a lot like garbage because I left it out on my work desk one night and by the morning they were all gone. I'm pretty sure the cleaner saw these Coke cans that, you know, I'm sure they didn't think that they were Batman's weapons. <laughs> so uh, so all, all, all the models are, are in the trash. 
And after wrapping the dark night, I got hired at Weta. And one of the first things I got asked was about the sticky bombs. They didn't even know they weren't real. And that was probably the greatest compliment that I've ever got uh, on my work. I came down to New Zealand in 2009 to work at Weta on Avatar. And honestly, it's, it's an honor and a privilege and a, a challenge to be working with so many creative people at, uh, at, on the Weta team working with heaps of the most brilliant artists, painters, armorers, um, leathersmiths, and uh, film technicians, and, and artists from all over the globe. It's kind of like a super creative UN. And in addition to lighting, um, I've helped out in modeling and particle effects uh, at different departments, including uh, Tintin, X-Men First Class, The Avengers, and Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. And I've also been the model for a bunch of our video channels. <laughs> I can't believe I'm actually showing you this. I understand too. Um, and we're constantly changing the way that we do things. Our tools are always evolving. And we never stop pushing our limits. But at the same time, the artistic vision is always at the forefront. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of how we use the vast technological tools at our disposal to realize the director's artistic vision. This, this is um, one of my shots from, from The Adventures of Tintin. This is an animation pass. This is how it all starts um, in, in, a, in a shot. You can see the, the, the placeholder geo and uh, the, the, the sand, parts of the, the sand in play and how we're displacing the uh, sand through the, through the footsteps of the characters. This is the view that the animators and camera departments start with really quick, little resolution geometry. They can uh, turn it around quick, and the director is able to make changes to the action and approve it from here. Then our particle guys do things like ambient sand blowing around, sort of uh, particle uh, fluid simulations. Then it comes to lighting. Then we add the sun and make them look realistic and interact with the environment more add sweat to their brows, um, sand to their hair, and use all the techniques that I showed you earlier, um, heat distortion. Uh, it takes weeks and sometimes months to get up to this point. And then I send it off to the compositor to build the final image. This is the helicarrier from Avengers. So if anyone hasn't seen it, maybe just, you know. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is the early stage of, uh, of a VFX shot, um, not, a, not a fully animated uh, one, although this shot actually uh, pretty much was. Here you could see the pre model, the uh, basic camera motion, even the blocking of the timing of the explosion that we'll be putting in at a later stage. All gray, no textures, no lighting, pure um, uh, moving storyboard. Then it goes to animation. Now you can see a little bit more refined camera move, camera shake. Um, you can see the Quinjet in the background. Uh, larger debris pieces are, are now animated, falling away. The engines are now animated to be spinning. Then it enters the lighting. And here we use our spherical harmonics um, uh, pipeline with HDR images taken from set uh, to achieve a more photoreal kind of look. In a shot like this, we use ray, uh, ray trace reflections and uh, anisotropic scattering through the clouds in the background, which, uh, which was done in our proprietary uh, cloud uh, system. Matte painting of the sky in the background as well. Uh, Fluid bodies used for the main explosion that you see, and rigid body simulations used for the smaller debris that you see falling uh, away from that. And from here, I pass it on to the compositor to put the image together with the matte painting and layer everything together, and lens flare and all that kind of um, goodies to really help uh, bring the shot to life. Then the shot's complete, and we put it in the movie. So it's common wisdom that if you pull back the curtain and see how the magic's made, that you lose a little bit of the magic or the wonder. But I don't actually find that's the case at all. I still love what I do. I think we, we 
do make magic, and we do it by applying our, our artistic talents and our, our creative instincts using tools that are constantly evolving, almost as fast as our imaginations do. And some of what's on the horizon blows my mind. But it's not a job that you can coast in. And I'm sure neither are yours. I'm sure a lot of you are also working at this intersection of, of art and technology. Uh, for exactly that reason, because the technology keeps moving so fast, and if you don't keep up, you'll be left behind. But I think as long as you remember that the magic doesn't live in your computer or your keyboard, it, it lies in your ability to manipulate whatever tools you have at your disposal now, uh, 50 years from now, uh, to reach what you're imagining in your, in, your, in your mind. And if you're not pushing up against that technology constantly, then you're probably not um, imagining hard enough. And I said earlier that if we do our jobs as visual effects um, artists well, that if we bring our imagery to life, which takes all of our artistic talent and, and our combined technical knowledge, then hopefully we'll even notice we did a thing that, that nine foot al blue aliens could exist, um, that a wizard could raise an army of orcs, or that an aircraft carrier can fly. And to me, that's exactly what magic is. Thank you.